I think our children um, have more robust intelligence and in, in questioning um, to be able to cope with looking at all the different theories that are out there. Looking at all the different theories that are out there. I agree. I wish there was time for children to learn all the different theories. They were shaped by extraordinary people who decided to observe the stars, the rocks, life, heat, light and matter with open minds. They made conclusions based on evidence, not their religious beliefs. Surely the knowledge they've handed down to us will never be kept from our children. We have a revelation from the one who says, I know everything, I've always been there, here's what happened in the past. So when we take that revelation, put on our set of glasses, and we look at the evidence, we can say, ah, now I understand, fossils couldn't have formed before sin, there was no death before sin, there was a global flood that connects to geology. What is the age of the earth? When did the creation actually occur? And of course, we're going to go to the Bible. How we make advances in science is being open to all different perspectives, and that's all that we're calling for. Let's qualify that. Fundamentalists don't advocate teaching all of the thousands of different perspectives that are out there, like the idea that the Earth is expanding, or that aliens from another planet help build the pyramids. What they want is to be able to teach just one different perspective, and the fundamentalist lobby is running a well-targeted campaign to convince parents, not just in the United States but also in other countries, of two things. That creation science and intelligent design are science, and that there's a real debate about our origins going on within the scientific community. And let's face it, most people don't know that much about science or about what goes on within the scientific community. So the first thing to recognize and to be honest about is that this has nothing to do with science. We take that revelation, put on our set of glasses. As I explained in the last video, the scientific method made easy. Starting with a conclusion and then looking for the evidence afterwards shatters the first golden rule of science. It's not even the way our courts operate. If you know your conclusion in advance, why even bother looking at the evidence? Any kind of scientific research becomes futile. This is so obvious even to non-scientists that advocates of creation science soon realized it wasn't a great way to break into the science curriculum, so the label was dropped in favor of something that was much vaguer, but sounded more thoughtful. Intelligent design takes a simple two-step approach. Find something complicated that we don't yet understand and conclude that because we don't understand it, the best explanation is to assume the work of an invisible being or to put it in a way that sounds a little more scientific, an intelligent designer. In fact, researchers who've applied the scientific method to these supposedly intractable problems have discovered their origins consistent with what we know and understand, even for things that seem to be very unintelligently designed. But even if they hadn't, this leap from problem to conclusion is not how science works. As we saw in the last video on the scientific method, real scientists investigate things we don't understand, however complicated, until they come up with a workable hypothesis. Based on that hypothesis, they then make a prediction that's rigorously tested. Only when a hypothesis has been successfully tested can a conclusion be reached. Advocates of intelligent design aren't prepared to make predictions, let alone test them. So it's not science, maybe not even a hypothesis, because intelligent design doesn't explain the process by which organisms were designed and made. It would be just as useful to say it all happened by magic. So the two sides of this supposed debate are beginning to look decidedly unequal. The theory of intelligent design isn't a theory at all. It's an untested idea. And we never include untested ideas in the school science curriculum, not only because they haven't been reviewed or verified or derived by the scientific method, but because there are so many untested ideas out there that fill the entire science curriculum. 
As for the notion that the scientific community is divided, OK, on one side we have biologists, including many Christian, Muslim, Jewish and Hindu biologists who accept evolution, and on the other side we have biologists who believe in intelligent design. So the scientific community isn't divided over this question at all. There's an overwhelming consensus. The people who are calling for their ideas to be injected into the science curriculum are outside the scientific community and are happy to display a breathtaking ignorance of the subject they're tackling. Somehow, that mud found a way to grow, reproduce, swim, crawl. Somehow this happened? If Ben Stein is going to disagree with the theory of evolution, at least he has to understand how it works. People like Stein may have fallen asleep in biology class, but there's no excuse for denying our children a decent science education, insisting instead that they dumb down to our level of ignorance. And should we really be telling children that if they come up against a problem as scientists, they shouldn't try to investigate or resolve it? It's okay to assume it's the work of an invisible being. How far would that have got us in the last 500 years? In the 16th century, this was a key piece of evidence for intelligent design. There was simply no way to explain it. How could each colour know where it had to go in the rainbow? And how did they all know how to form a perfect semicircle together? The only way these colours could be put into such a perfect and regular pattern is if an intelligent designer was arranging them. Intelligent design, like creation science, makes scientific research futile, and not just in the field of biology. Intelligent design advocates like Kent Hovind define evolution as everything from the unfolding of the universe to the deposition of sedimentary rocks. Cosmology, geology, physics, archaeology, anything that goes against the literal interpretation of the Bible is under threat. So the aim of the intelligent design lobby isn't to open minds or look at all the different perspectives or both sides of an imaginary scientific debate. The aim is to make science look murky and indecisive and cast doubt on theories that are the foundation of our knowledge. The strengths of science are used against it. The willingness of scientists to admit errors, correct them and to modify hypotheses is used as proof that they can get things wrong. The word theory, the highest form of proof you can get in science short of mathematics, is mistranslated into uncertainty. Slowly the solid facts established by centuries of scientific study are eroded. If untested hypotheses are taught alongside verified theories, we're reducing the idea of science to just a barrow load of ideas and asking children to sort out for themselves which are facts based on evidence and which are conjecture. The result is confusion, vagueness and disinterest. We're not opening young minds, we're emptying them. The intrusion into science teaching threatens a number of countries, but none more so than the United States. A hundred years ago, the USA was admired as a technological powerhouse. In the technologies of the 20th century, the United States was unsurpassed. of the 21st century is that new technologies have emerged and other countries are catching up. It may be hard to fathom but children in these countries spend their time in science class actually learning about science. Teachers don't have to use up valuable time debating the role of an imaginary designer to placate a religious lobby or dilute scientific facts to conform to ancient religious texts. They're already preparing the next generation of scientists. Are we? Who should you always trust first? Trust first, God or the scientist? God. God, and I want you to remember that. 